Tonight on Joy News Prime, Governor New Patriotic Party responds to debate challenge thrown by the NDC flag bearer John Mahama saying it is not in the party's plan for now. But we want to make one thing clear. The NDP will fight these elections on our own terms. The NDP is not going to fight these elections uh, on the terms of Mr. John Damani Mahama and that of the NDC. Former President John Mahama had called for the debate he believed should settle the argument over who had performed better by way of infrastructure development. We can settle it easily. Let's have a debate between two of us, the two presidents. Let Nana Kufuado come and sit down. Let me sit down and let's debate our records. No one from the campaign show, the NDC flag bearer who is touring the Volta region, has expressed regret he couldn't fix the Eastern Corridor Road while in office. My one regret is that we didn't complete this famous Eastern Corridor Road before we left. And by the time we left, all segments of it were being wiped out. President Ekofo Adohuis in the central region has cut short for the construction of the Elmina fishing port. Once completed, Nananum, I appeal to you to help ensure that a prudent maintenance culture is adopted by management in the use of the fishing port. We'll be speaking with our correspondents who are on the campaign trail. Also in this bulletin, Ghana Health Service records five more deaths and 166 new cases as the country's COVID-19 case count reaches 43,260. With the number of active cases still less than 2,000, the health service meanwhile insists there is no deliberate attempt to reduce testing for COVID-19. There is nothing like reduced contact tracing. Our contact tracing is that if I am positive, you test my contacts. We'll hear from the Ghana Public Health Association what they make of government's COVID-19 response so far and their recommendations on the way forward. Plus, we hit the streets to ask people why they are not wearing face masks. I don't believe there is any virus. I still don't believe there is any virus. Mm. And in business? Goyal kickstarts nationwide recruitment of local engineers in anticipation of new offshore oil discovery. Goyal, we have a, a subsidiary Goyal Offshore. We have recruited young, brilliant Ghanaians, engineers, geologists, geological engineers, and others who are being trained by Exxon. So technology transfer. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Join News Prime is coming to you live from our studio in Kukumlimle here in Accra on your digital terrestrial TV because we are free to air on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. Many thanks for choosing us. The Ghana Health Service has maintained there is no deliberate attempt to downplay the COVID-19 situation in Ghana. It comes as criticism mounts that the service is not conducting enough tests to give the impression the disease is under control. Addressing a news conference on Ghana's COVID-19 response so far, Director General Dr. Patrick Abouaje refuted suggestions it has stopped contact tracing of persons who have COVID-19. There is nothing like reduced contact tracing. Our contact tracing is that if I am positive, you test my contacts, okay? If you have 2,000 positives, you are likely to have more contacts to follow than if you have 100 cases. So it's not like you have a certain number of contacts you must always look for. It depends on the number of contacts you have to follow and also those who have symptoms that will be tested. So that's what determines how many contacts you follow. We can also look at at-risk group, which we continue to do, and add them up. So that is so, there's no magic number that you must do, for example, 5,000 contacts or so a day. It depends on what you had the previous day and what response you are going to, to get. In the area of, um, so nobody has stopped contact tracing. If you have, positive and have four contacts. Unlike before, why we wait for those four contacts to fall sick or have something before we test them. Now we test them immediately and that's what has given us the large number of tests that we are doing. 
Speaking at the same event, Head of uh, Disease Surveillance at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Franklin C. Dubeque, revealed less than 50% of people in the greater Accra region wear their face mask properly. He shares more from the survey conducted from the 5th to 8th August 2020. For, for the three surveys so far, we actually um, observed 42,317 uh, persons, and the maximum was on survey one. That was actually done um, on the morning of the 5th. And so that one actually saved 20,208. Um, Next slide. So these were the key findings. The first survey, the main finding was that 42.3% of the persons that were observed were actually correctly using the, the mask. And then you have 326 who were not correctly using it. So in that case, you can see that there's over 75 people who had the intention of using the mask correctly. So that's the first survey. And then we tried to look at, break it down by the locations. And you can see from this um, breakdown that the Kologoni Beach Road is the area that has the lowest in terms of people who were correctly wearing the face mask. So you can see that it's less than 2% of the persons were actually wearing it. And rather, the people who were going to Temahosto were the people who had the, the best. They were actually, 90% of them were correctly wearing the face mask. Next slide. Then the survey two. That's the one that was done between the hours of 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And what you can see is that 33.5% of the people were correctly wearing the mask, while 31.4. So in that case, you see that 65% of Ghanaians at that time that were surveyed were correctly, were having the intention to use the face mask. If you decide to break it down uh, by category, it still boils down to the same fact that the Kolegoni Beach Road still had the lowest. So it tells you that the people at that particular lo location had a very low tendency to correctly wear the face mask. And um, the people in the Tema Hostel were the best. I think that it has to do with our enforcement. As people are going to the hostel, they are more motivated to wear the mask compared to people who are maybe having fun. The last one was the one that was done at the markets. So this one, 44.3% of the people who were in the market, and I said that there are five categories that we actually observed. 44.3 were correctly wearing the mask, and 37.7 were correctly wearing the mask. It tells you that 82% of people in the market had the intention to correctly or have a mask. So we decided to look at the four markets. Which of them had the best in terms of correctly wearing a mask. And this slide is showing that Malamata, actually 52.1% of the people who were observed in Malamata were correctly wearing a mask, as opposed to Mokalada had 413 Next slide. So based on the categories that were observed, which people were correctly wearing a mask? And then surprisingly, the headquarters, the 59.1% the of them were correctly wearing a mask. And then the buyers, the people who are going to buy, I think they have a low perception of risk. They, 32.3 30, of them, were, quite, were, not quite, were just correctly wearing a mask. It tells you that the, the, the headquarters at that time of the survey had a, a better perception of risk. Next slide. So this last slide is giving an, an average of the, of the survey findings. The first survey is saying that 42.3 of people that were observed correctly wore the, wore the mask. Survey 2 said 33.5 correctly wore the mask. And the last one that was done in the market said 44.3. So that is a summary of the surveys that were done on the 5th and the 8th of August. So we conclude by saying that 82% of Ghanaians that were surveyed in Accra between the 5th and 8th of August had the intention to actually use a mask. There's an intention because they actually had a mask. But we we'll conclude by saying that less than 50% of them actually had a mask and use it appropriately. In the last COVID-19 update from the Ghana Health Service, five more deaths have been recorded with 166 new cases. It brings the case count to 43,260 confirmed since March with 41,267 recoveries and discharges and 261 deaths. The latest deaths include a 36-year-old male from Great Accra with an unknown comorbidity, while the new cases being tested on 1,499 samples had a positivity rate of 11%. The Ghana Public Health Association has meanwhile listed a raft 
of recommendations on how it believes the country should tackle the pandemic going forward. Among the recommendations is a barring of the citizens of some countries from entering Ghana when the airport is finally opened to international travel. Now joining me via Zoom is the General Secretary of the Association, Dr. Gilbert Buckle. Doc, thank you so much for joining us. Now, the Ghana Health Service has come under fire for not conducting enough COVID-19 tests and thereby downplaying the COVID-19 situation. This they have denied uh, today. But where do you stand on that? Um, again, thank you very much for having us on the show. Um, I also just listened to the Director General with his statements. And from a, a public health perspective, the, um, the description he gave of what a contact is and what a contact tracing is, is, um, is acceptable and is the proper thing to do. We are not privy to, to any other information apart from what has been put out in the public domain. Our colleagues in the Public Health Association who are on the ground have not indicated that there's a conscious effort not to test individuals. Um, so really, the, it, um, the description that Dr. General gave is is accurate from a practice well now you are recommending that passengers from europe usa and latin america should not be allowed into the country when the borders are open to international travel why exactly are you saying that um this 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 is not new to ghana and it shouldn't be new to into the countries involved um these are high-risk countries where the the virus is spreading where infection rates are soaring um it would be to be negligent on our part not to recognize the potential risk of having nationals or persons in these um, environments coming into Ghana. And I want to believe European countries and others have done similar in the interest of their people. And Ghana should not be seen to be any different in that situation. There's nothing personal about the, this, this recommendation, but it's only practical public health practice to limit high-risk individuals to get into environments which are low risk like Ghana itself. I'm grateful for your time. Dr. Gilbert Buckle is uh, the General Secretary of the Ghana Public Health Association. He's been uh, recommending some, um, he's been giving recommendations for uh, uh, opening of international travel. Um, Mr. Buckle, please stay on for me because we have Albert Story and Rafiq Salam, who are our correspondents in the Upper East and Upper West regions. Uh, let me start with Rafiq. Rafiq, um, last week you talked about samples that were sent to Tamale and of course, waiting for the results. Uh, let me go to uh, Albert because Rafiq is not ready. Albert, uh, tell me, are, are the results in uh, from the samples that were sent to Tamale last week? Yes, I said. So uh, what we have is 29 results out of about 260 samples that were sent to Tamale um, in the last four weeks. So uh, according to the Regional Director of Health Services, um, uh, from four weeks ago up to this week, 260 samples were sent to Tamale. Now, two days ago, they received only 29 uh, results from those samples that were sent. And so um, while they were receiving that 29, another 20 had been uh, sent again to Tamale. Now, what is happening is that out of the 29 um, samples whose results they've had now, uh, only uh, but what he says is that unfortunately, uh, that patient died two days after they took her sample. She's a 64-year-old woman uh, who passed away just two days after her sample was taken. Uh, it turned out that uh, uh, 14 days later, they've had the results uh, of her test, and it turns out she was positive, but she has already passed on. So the new uh, sample, the 20 that they sent this week, um, include uh, people who, you know, had come in contact with that woman who has now died. Uh, you know, they, they got those people through contact tracing. And uh, you know, their samples are part of the 20 that they sent this week. And uh, they've been asked to self-isolate while they wait for the results. Well, I'll get to Rafiq uh, soon to get uh, the reactions from the Upper West region uh, where he is. But let me come back to you, Dr. Uh, Buckle. I don't know how you feel about the delay in, in test results. But again, let's, uh, let me ask you for the recommendations you were making. Because you also have a position about the reopening of schools. I need you to tell me more about that. You know, we, we are mindful that um, tertiary institutions are opening. These are 
healthy, much or stronger individuals. Uh, we are talking of opening pre, you know, kindergartens, primary schools. And the question becomes, what is the, the real value of opening primary schools? What really is with the benefit of opening a primary school when there's so the risk of these children contracting it? And globally, there's, there's a, rising, a rising situation of children, pediatrics, pediatric um, COVID infections. So from a, a public health perspective, from protecting the population, from minimizing risk, and not, um, not necessarily um, just opening everything up, it should, we do not necessarily have to pursue opening up kindergartens, primary school, you know, up to primary school, even GSS. Even, there's no agency in it, and there's no need to put the population at risk. Mm. But the, yeah. earlier I talked about the delay in tests, and you listened to our correspondents in the Upper East region, how delayed, how is this affecting our fight against the virus? You know, there, there are about two or three scenarios here. For those who are the clinicians, those who have to treat people, it, it makes it very difficult to confirm a diagnosis and go ahead and treat, especially when the symptoms may be like the common cold and you need to be sure what you are doing. So a delay in receiving lab results is totally not in our interest in terms of providing clinical care. The other aspect is a delay in receiving the results is also not interested in the, it's not in the interest of the population. These are people who may not necessarily be quarantined. They may come with one or the other odd system, which is not sufficient to have them quarantined. They go home, and then they come back only to find that they are positive. And you can imagine the number of people who, be, who would have been um, contact, would have contacted them and possibly contracted the infection as well. I myself got traveled and came back about five weeks ago. I went through the quarantine. I got my result in six days. But we are told now that um, the time for the backlog has been mopped up significantly. That's the information we have. And we're also being told that um, the response time is being whittled down to two to three days, which is very different from what the correspondence is coming saying from the field. But it is critical that the results come in as soon as possible. 24, 48 hours would be fantastic. Dr. Gilbert Buckle is the General Secretary of the Ghana Public Health Association. I'm grateful for your time. Now, we went out there onto the streets to find out if people are wearing their mask. Here's what we found. About three months ago, when Ghana was at the height of its positive coronavirus cases, many Ghanaians and in fact all uh, were encouraged and actively pursued usage of the face mask. Unfortunately, a few months down the line, today as at August 20th, 2020, I'm in part of Circle Accra where face mask usage is either not used at all or used wrongly. I'm going to speak to some of the residents and the passerby here on why they have relaxed their uh, their duties on protecting themselves from the coronavirus. So um, we, we understand you are not in the face mask. Is there any special reason? No, really. you don't have any reason. Mm. But aren't you afraid you may contract the virus? No, you're not afraid. I don't believe there is any virus. You still don't believe there's any virus. No, no, no. But you know, Ghana has. You've heard, um, Ghana has over uh, forty thousand. I don't. I don't. Believe. Okay, so you're telling us that when you go to offices, you do it. I put it on. But After I, I came out of the office, I removed it. But it's been like five months. I, I'm so, I'm so confused. Why, why don't I you put it on? I can't breathe through. Okay. But you don't believe coronavirus exists? I don't believe it. Well, is it like a family thing or you're the only one? Where you live, is that all of you don't believe it? No, it's only me. Only you? Yes. Why, why again? I don't know. I don't know. But then I don't believe it. So what will it take for you to believe there is coronavirus? I don't even know. I have more than 2,000 friends, and I haven't seen or heard of any of them contracting the virus. I don't, I don't know, uh, like, I don't know, like, this person has a virus, no. So a friend contracted it, so you don't believe it? Mm -mm. Well, the virus is still in existence, and then it's still risky. Even though some of us don't believe that the virus exists. You don't believe it exists? Some of them don't believe. Okay. Because you see people walking about with no nose marks, anything. But the virus is still there. 
I believe there is a virus. Yeah. So I'm always protected. But, but, but would you believe if I told you you are not wearing your face mask rightly? Yes, but I've been wearing it right, but I want to breathe a little more. That is why I've drawn it to my nose. The same air that contains a little bit of the coronavirus? Well, I heard it's not airborne. Okay. Yes, so I just want to breathe a little while. That is why I have drawn my notes marks like that. But hey, boss. Oh, uh -huh. hey, no problem. Yeah, who's the asset? When I'm on share face mask, why comfortable? Who's the one gloves? We are not here. I didn't hear. Ah, boss, me that me me you say Arabia or me that me me checking those masks. Still, when you say Arabia, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you four can you be be and nipa, you say be the two, nipa two hundred, they will never. Still, when you say coronavirus, oh. Me that me you me you need to me 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 no smart no cry me nim dey dey eh it what we news so i think can dey 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 anya no cry anya no cry dey 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 now hey free ah i'm pending for now join am i join no much there oh ah to me that me you need say arabia oh it dey dey be say asan wa jedi ti say bbs and san ma won say ti say bbs and san ma jedi because me o mo say yare aba me won say Areas I'm woman or yari ni biachi will be our man uda. And so tembi I say yari or me me who yari bi a me da minyi ni. Eh, frauze. Eh, frauze is Sam Tuga. Sam Tuga. Eh, you better say. So Sam Tuga says he still does not believe, just like many of the others, he still does not believe that the virus exists anyway. It's an opinion, according to him, that the government has expressed. He still doesn't see any need, and as such, he doesn't see any need to put on face mask. In the other question, I want to wear the mask in the only thing that I want to do. Oh, that's right. I mean, I'm sure that. 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 I'm sure let me pick your quick reaction on this one, Dr. Gilbert Buckle, uh, that uh, people are feeling that there is nothing like COVID-19 out there. No, it, it, it's unfortunate that the population is becoming complacent. Um, currently, the, 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 the way that the COVID is transmitted requires personal protection. It requires us to, to protect ourselves. And it's, uh, it's also, it is real and it is, it is there. So we need to tighten up the education. We need to let people understand that, hey, it is real. If it's about you know, providing graphic stories and getting those who contracted the disease to voluntarily come and tell their story, it becomes important. If we keep at this rate and people become more and increasingly complex, then we'll be going back to ground zero where nobody is prepared to do the physical distancing, let them do a face mask or protect themselves let alone do hand washing. And these are very basic things that will become important. So it is, it, is, it, is, it is unfortunate, but we need to up our public education. We need to get people who've actually been infected to be the ones who give the messages and not those of our care. We need to also get the caregivers themselves to tell their stories of what they are seeing and what is happening, to be able to support people to take care of themselves as they should. I appreciate your time, Dr. Gilbert uh, Buckle is the General Secretary of the Ghana Public Health Association. Hello there, it's time for business with me, Charles Aite. Ghana's downstream petroleum player, Goyal, is awaiting results of data collected by its partner, ExxonMobil, for the exploration of oil in the offshore Cape Three Point. Now, the company has also invested in the nationwide recruitment of local engineers to help in the exploration and production process. Managing Director of Goyal, Kwame Osei Prempe, disclosed this to Joy Business after a virtual annual meeting of the company. Here's a report. Goyal Offshore, a subsidiary of the Goyal Group, signed a partnership agreement with the American oil production giant ExxonMobil to explore oil in the deep water Cape Three Points. After a few months of signing the agreement, the company has begun work on the data from the field to examine the potential of managing director of Goyal, Kwame Osei Prempe, told Joy Business that Goyal is ready to receive a positive news from the team soon after training some local engineers and geologists to support the operation. John is very so much experience in this. Though, so they've collected the seismic data, they've taken it to their, head, their office in the U.S., they are analyzing. Uh, um, so far, we believe that the information they are giving us is good. Then the major benefit to us is that Goyal, we have uh, a subsidiary Goyal Offshore. We have recruited young, brilliant Ghanaians, engineers, geologists, geological engineers, and others who are being trained by Exxon. So technology transfer. So we believe that even at the end of it, 
if you don't get what you really want, we have made an investment in Ghanaians which will go to benefit this country moving forward. Meanwhile, the company, after ending the year with a 105.5 million CD profit, declared some dividends for shareholders. Here is board chairman Kwame Nabatels. Declaring that dividend, we said we were involved in a lot of projects which is going to help the company increase its profitability in the future and the various investments that we have made in those projects is the reason why we had declared that amount of profit by more than 9% attributed to mining diesel, bunkering, and aviation fuel. And that's it by way of business. Gary L. Smith is up next with sports. Just stay. <laughs> Today is 25 years, and you can see the full story of how it happened from the group stages all the way to the grand finale on myjoyonline.com. We have a piece to commemorate that. Now, Hearts of Oaks Academy construction is in its first phase, and it's 80% complete, according to the project manager, Togbe Drake Chigbe IV. Speaking to Joy Sports, Mr. Drake said the agreement reached with the contractor shows they are ahead of schedule. House of Oak gave the local contractor, KA Estate Company Limited, four months to complete the first phase of construction for the Pobiman Academy project. Work began on the site early last month, and it appears the contractor could hand over the facility to the Phobians by the first week of October, according to project manager Togbe Drake Chigbe the Fort. He says 80% of the agreement reached has been done. Uh, on paper, uh, he is supposed to pack out from here on the 1st of October. That's if nothing changes. By 1st of October, he should be leaving site. But from what he's doing or where he's gotten to now, it is very possible he could finish before the 1st of October. Uh, as much as management is concerned, um, and I would say being the liaison between the contractor and the management, to, I don't think we've encountered any challenges, at least for now. There's not been any. And, and then uh, on the part of the contractor, too, he's also not actually made any comments of such a thing. Whichever way, I am always here with him. And if there are challenges, which person, if he has some, to definitely I would know. But uh, from what we see, we don't or we've not encountered any, any natural or uh, I would say an unnatural kind of We've not experienced any kind of um, challenges. Work done so far appears to be far from the 80% he claims, but he explained the key responsibilities handed to the engineer. What he's been doing or the mandate we've given to him is to complete all the foundation works for the eight individual blocks that the, the academy has, being it the hostel blocks, being in the dining facility, being in the gym, the training center, and the semi-detached houses. So from what we can see, he's, as I said, he is about 80% true. He's just level filling and then casting the slab, and then he's virtually done with the mandates that we have given him to do. So House of Oak launched the construction of the facility on their 108th anniversary last year. And that's the spot for now. My colleague Hans Mensa and I will try to get in touch with Emmanuel Bentel again. That will be at 10.30 on... Fan zone. I'm Gary Al Smith, and that's the sport for now. And it's time for showbiz. Becky is here with the very latest. Hi, Becky. Hello, Aisha. How What's you doing? Up? I'm good, good, good. Um, well, let's uh, thank Ghanaians for 
uh, you know, donating. Remember the guy, this, this one artist um, uh, on social media that people have been calling for support for him. Yeah. I understand that uh, he's gotten the uh, needed support now and Sergio will soon uh, comment. Social media users, uh, they have started a campaign to raise funds to pay for the surgery of popular artist Emmanuel Apropo, best known as Ray Style. The young artist has been critically ill from liver cancer, causing a considerable weight loss. Uh, several revered personalities, including the First Lady, uh, have joined the appeal for funds targeted to raise 40,000 euros needed for Sergi. And uh, Ghanaians have done well, and so they have uh, donated to that cause. But Aisha, let's talk about Lexus Bill. Mm. Our very own Lexus Bill. Okay. Lexus Bill um, started a challenge on social media, the Lexus Recovery Challenge. You know, when he started uh, his uh, work with Lexus, he had a little injury. Mm. And so he, uh, you know, recovered from that from injury. It and he was in and tweeting people to you know join in the challenge, mm. and so today we we caught up with Lexus, asking him what exactly uh, you know is the motivation and why we're doing this Lexus bill, everybody. Can't wait for work with Lexus, Aisha. Mm. We have to do the work. Yeah, it's very very important. important. I mean, yeah. from the lockdown, <laughs> we've eaten plenty. <laughs> no, my <laughs> tummy is looking. Calories. My tummy is looking very. But my dear Michelle. Yes. He um, is on Spotlight today. Mm. You know that he has turned to a pasta, but he's still acting. He said, well, he won't kiss in... He does both. Both, okay. yeah. So today we decided to put the spotlight on Majid Michel. Oh, nice guy. Yes, Majid and, um, Michel. He's a good actor. Yeah, he is. Well, good thing is he hasn't quit acting. Yeah, he's yeah. still acting. Yes. Wish him well. And thanks so much for bringing us showbiz. Anytime, Aisha. <laughs> and that'll be it for showbiz. Welcome back to Joy News Prime. On your election headquarters, the governing New Patriotic Party says a debate between President Ekofuado and former President Mahama is not on the cards at the moment. Flag bearer of the opposition NDC, John Mahama, had challenged the president to a debate on the record of their governments, especially infrastructure. It comes after Vice President Dr. Mahamadou Balmier's presentation on Tuesday proved Akufuado's government has a superior record addressing residents in the K2 South constituency Wednesday as part of his four-day tour of the Volta region. Former President Mahama said a debate will bring a conclusion to the matter. But it's easy to settle the issue of infrastructure. At all, the president said this election is going to be an election of track records, comparing his track record to my track record. We can settle it easily. Let's have a debate between two of us, the two presidents. Let Nana Kufuado come and sit down. Let me sit down and let's debate our records. Responding to the challenge, MPP national organizer Samuel Uko said the party is not interested in such a debate at the moment. He spoke on the polls earlier. I uh, want to make one thing clear. The MPP will fight these elections on our own terms. The MPP is not going to fight these elections. Uh, on the terms of Mr. John Damani Mahan and that of the NDC. So meaning that you do acknowledge that Dr. Baumia did make some solid presentation, data driven. These are not uh, uh, projects that you can just imagine. These are projects that you can feel, you can see, they are tangible. You don't need a CCA to tell you something is happening around the Pokwasi interchange area. You don't need someone to tell you that there's something happening around the Temamoto way. The interchange. You also don't need someone to tell you when you use the Abosio Kain area uh, of the Bechebelamte interchange. You don't need someone to tell you about what is happening on the Terma Pakadan railway line. You see it, you walk through it, you know that there's something happening. You also do not need someone to uh, just lie to you or try to play propaganda. When we say that if you go to Tamale today, 
that have their affairs since a change in modern ground under the NDP's uh, administration, the Sino Hydro project, where we've, we've, we've cut. So well, I'm, I'm not too sure what Mr. Mahama wants us to do on this one. But as I said, mm. we have our own campaign strategies and we have our own campaign plans. The NDP will go according to our own strategy. If the need arises, and mm. you feel that it's necessary, then we can give it a thought. Well, I'm sure the Ghanaian people also can feel and they can see that indeed the NPP is also working and we've done, we've done a fantastic job. And uh, if you take um, under the one village, one dam initiative, in excess of over 400 dams, but with over 370 or so plus completed and working. So I don't need a debate to tell you that. These are tangible things. These are things that are happening across the country. If Mr. Mahama wants a debate, well, from where I sit today, I don't think the NPP has uh, given it a thought yet. President Ekofuado has cut the thought for the construction of the Elmina Fishing Port Project expected to boost the fishing industry in that town. It will also include the Elmina Fishing Rehabilitation and Expansion Project that was originally said to be financed by the CDB loan from China. Addressing the chiefs and people of the area, the president indicated the government had secured different funding from Belgium for the construction of a new fishing port for the area. He explained the project will first seek to upgrade the existing facilities such as the administration building and the dredging of the existing port among others. And, um, government recognizes the significant contribution of the fishing industry to our non-traditional export market. In spite of the good st strides we have been making over the years in the industry in relation to infrastructure development for fishing communities, we believe that we can do more in terms of export of processed fish and fish-related products to rake extra revenue for our country. The government continues to make deliberate efforts to make value addition a priority through policy interventions for companies. I urge the ministers of transport, fisheries and works and housing, the contractors and consultants to work closely together to execute this project diligently and ensure it is completed on time and on budget. Once completed, Lenanum, I appeal to you to help ensure that a prudent maintenance culture is adopted by management in the use of the fishing port. All of us must appreciate that the deterioration of infrastructure and other assets of state are an enormous drain on our national resources, and this port should not suffer the fates of other facilities with a poor maintenance culture. The Nanum and residents of our Nina, I thank you for your continued support for the work of my government in my first term, and God willing, with four more for Nana and the MPP, we shall all gather here to commission this project soon. The president also announced a policy of revenue sharing with traditional authorities where castles and forts are located and also promised the Omanheni of the Dina traditional area some support to build a palace. During the construction of an admin, additional administrative building, a shed for the fish market, a shed for fishing net mending, two coal stores and ice factories, a new slipway for bigger vessels with a boat refurbishment area, a toilet block, and a daycare center. The project will also provide beach and coastal protection works, as well as restoration of the area in front of the Elmina Castle to enhance tourism. I want to reaffirm, in response to Edina Mahin, the statement just made by the Minister for Tourism, Creative Arts and Culture, that a new policy is being worked out to enhance revenue sharing with traditional authorities of the location of our co castles and forts along our coast. So, Nana Kundia, you will hear from us soon, and you will also receive assistance to complete John Ajakun Kufo's construction and of a new palace for you. A chief of your standing should not be exposed to the threats of a landlord. You should be your own landlord. 
Joining us via Zoom is correspondent Richard Kwejo Nyaku with more. Uh, Kwejo, has the president said anything at all about the challenge thrown to him by his main challenger in the December election for a debate on infrastructure records? Well, it has, it has not come up. Um, none of the people that are following the president um, has responded to uh, this challenge thrown by President Mahama. So this thing hasn't come up yet. But what else um, has the president been up to? So from Elmina, where the president commissioned um, cuts out for the Elmina uh, landing port, uh, we proceeded to Chifu Praso, where the president inspected uh, works ongoing on the Chifu Praso bridge. And we are told that it will cost uh, $40 million after that. We also went to uh, the Chifu government hospital where works are still ongoing and so that is what we've been doing the whole of today tomorrow the president is expected to do two commissioning of projects under the one district one factory the first one is the kufi juice and uh, fruit factory at a kufi and then the next one is casa Pa the potato processing factory at Gumwa Pewaz. and then um, the president will retire to keep coast and then on saturday the mpp would uh, launch its manifesto for uh, the election 2020. Richard Kwejanyaku is our Central Region Correspondent, and he's been bringing an update on what the president has been doing in the Central Region. Meanwhile, the NDC flag bearer, former president John Mahama, has expressed regret he couldn't work on the Eastern Corridor Road during his tenure. The former president, who is touring the Volta region, was addressing a debut of traditional leaders at Peki. The chief of Peki, Togbe Degan Kojo Dei, had earlier caution politicians to seize the tribalism banter over the Volta region. An integral part of Ghana, he says, must be accorded the needed respect. Dr. Dega Kojo Dei also lamented the deplorable nature of the Peki government hospital, which he says needs an urgent facelift. But that I mean to me, there is The NDC flag bearer, former President John Dramani Mahama, in a response said it is imperative that leaders unite the people instead of the divide and rule games for their selfish interests. He prom promised to fix the Eastern Corridor Road should he be elected president this December. We did not prevail. But at the same time, it was God's way of letting us appreciate the value of what we had. Because I've always said that if we they did not have the opportunity of seeing Nana Kufado and the MPP in government, we will not appreciate the work that NDC did when we were in office. To compare. compare. And indeed, the president himself has said this election is a comparison of track record. And I said, yes, we are prepared to have that comparison of track record. Because when it comes to track record, with development, infrastructure, schools, education, electricity, water, roads, the MPP has nothing to compare with that. Is that we didn't 
complete this famous Eastern Corridor Road before we left. And by the time we left, all segments of it were being wiped out. And I believe that if NDC had continued in office, today we won't be talking about the Eastern Corridor Road. Corridor Road. It would have been completed. But as I have announced in several places that I've gone, it is a number one priority for us. Because it's an important link between the northern and southern part of our country. This Eastern Corridor Road goes through 21 districts from south to north. And you can imagine the amount of agricultural products and others that come down this road to be able to reach the markets in Accra and Tema. And that is why Professor Mills conceptualized it and started to work on it. I continued and we didn't finish before we left. But I can assure you that as soon as we come, it is the number one priority. Ivy Seto Jita, correspondent in the Volta region. She joins us over the telephone with more. Ivy, uh, what else has, be, uh, has the flag bearer of the NDC been up to in that region? Well, uh, if I can hear you well, uh, the flag bearer of the NDC is currently living somewhere uh, where he met with the chief uh, and also hopefully the people and also the Zungu community. Uh, we are heading to Fanzo and then to Alavanyo and then that ends the so, tour. Now, he's been talking uh, basically on job creation and wherever he goes, uh, he looks at the problem generated by the chief, uh, then his put on it, especially the problems of roads, water, sanitation, and schools, hospitals as, as well. So depending on the community he gets to, he addresses the problems in those communities uh, and then promise that if he wins, he's going to fix all those uh, problems for these communities. So basically, he's been talking about for jobs, uh, projects, and also uh, the importance of uh, making free uh, civic education. Ivy Setoje is our correspondent in the Volta region. We'll be bringing you updates of the tour of the president, Ekofuado, and his uh, contender, uh, John Mahama, in all the regions. Uh, stay on the Joy News channel. Now, scores of people, including a young mom with a two-week-old baby, have been displaced as far ravaged a settlement at Kase in Kumase on Thursday. The fire believed to have been caused by the uh, siphoning of fuel at an illegal retailing joint got people fleeing their makeshift apartments at dawn. Lava Femme's Erasta Zasari was at the scene and now reports. Over 30 people who live in makeshift apartments here at Faris Kasi, a suburb of Kumase, have been rendered homeless. The fire, which started at dawn today, got residents rushing out of their rooms and leaving their belongings to the raging inferno. As day breaks, some of the affected residents are seen salvaging what is left of their belongings. Others, including this mother with a two-week-old baby, have nowhere to go. Regional Fire Commander ACFO Joshua Ngwa says their preliminary investigations point to the siphoning of fuel as the primary cause. Um, I was at the fire ground myself yesterday and Information gathered confirmed that there was a siphoning that was going on, and that actually that's where the fire started. But fortunately for them, the tanker involved left, so we got there. And when we got there, because of the nature of the occupancy there, that is the wooden structures that were there, and the area very very too is prone to the uh, high wind speed, so that make sure that the fire had to spread to a very, to a very big, large area. But so we actually had to use the Rambo style to get to the place. 
commandeer about four fire engines scattered all over, then we bring that inf inferno under control. So it's, it is true. That's why our, also our investigation seems to end, but we are yet to get the actual things. Then we will come out with that information well. Nadmo says it is now assessing the situation. Adusei Kweku Andrews is an officer with the Asukwa Nadmo office. So immediately we are here to assess the situation and then we will send our report to the our regional coordinating office so that they will also forward it to Accra. So any response will come from the headquarters that's Accra. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko, Kumase. Back here in Accra, my name is Aisha Ibrahim in the studio, but the West African Examination Council is denying the supposed leakage of exam papers in the ongoing WASI, insisting its strict security protocols before and after the printing of exam questions have been effective. Responding to growing calls and concerns from the general public and some stakeholders in the education sector, Head of Public Relations Agnes Taikujo says, WAIEC can only take responsibility for the leaked contact details of examiners and not the questions. She spoke earlier in an interview with Roland Walker on the AM show. No, I think that uh, with the issue of the examiners, it was circulated on social media, and we need to find out how we got the that, that would help us with our investigation because if it is from our anti-stan in house, so I think we want to get to the first. Now, are the, are the West African Examination Council, is it the first time that um, there has been this mass leakage of papers? I will not accept what you're saying because we have not said that anything has leaked. So if you say um, the, list, the papers, I don't know what you're talking about. If it's not about the fact that the examiner's list has gone out, yes. But when you talk about leakage of papers, no. It's taken to a certain all under security. I will not be able to tell you the kind of security. And then all under strict security. We do type setting, we do print reading. Then papers are printed still under very, very tight security. We have standards there at the press. You know, we have our cameras. People are not even allowed to take in their, uh, what do you call it, wristwatch or anything. You know, very tight security. You are searched before you enter. You are, I mean, you don't take mobile, you don't take anything. And those who enter the printing room, when you enter, you don't come out till you have finished for the day. You know, when it is done, and the third side, so from there, it's gone to the post, so it's printed, it's parcels, it's packed. And then we go to where we call packing, where it's packed uh, according to the number of candidates. And then there are bags, in security bags, we have our security padlock, then we send it to. The depots box they are to the school come and pick them from the depot or the strong room and to the center. Would you agree that the inability of the council, the West Africa Examination Council, uh, to adopt some of the tightest uh, security encryptive technology has led to the situation? I would not agree with you because it is not our inability to adopt. Tighter encrypted technology. That is what. But but we have a. Now, if, but if but I we but we have. If I hand over something to you, and after I've handed over something to you, um, um, what do you call it? Snapshots are taken. I don't think it is tighter encrypted security. I think investigations are going on, so I think I'll take it. The National Association of Graduate Teachers earlier called for a national probe into the leakage of exam papers. The minority in Parliament is also calling for cancellation of the leaked questions, but the president of NAT, Philip Larson, says cancelling the questions does not address the annual problem of leaked questions. But the cyber security unit of the Ghana Police Service is currently investigating the matter. Noel, a retired educationist, is blaming the competition for performance ranking among schools for the spate of exam leakages and more practices. Mrs. Theodosia Wilhelmina Jackson, who worked in the public sector for more than four decades, says as long as districts and other institutional heads are bent on showing off how they place in annual rankings, many would continue to aid students to cheat because it is what would make them appear to have worked hard in office for her it is very much a sign of a broken education system join us as mahmoud nuruddin spoke to mrs jackson and has filed this report 
it is exam season, that anxious time of the year when thousands of students take the exams expected to complete senior high school seen as a gateway to a brighter future. This competitive exams is considered to be fair and transparent, but recent times have seen a mountain outcry over thriving exam cheating industry in which students and their collaborators seek to game the system. But for students to boldly come out, that is their right and therefore they should be given the chance to cheat and invigilators are humiliated. It's something we are strongly against. And all Mrs. All Jackson people, says she is very worried about the impact it has on the moral fabric of children. She day. says the system will not be able to trust anyone when the education does not reflect in them. From the home, even home, when children are eating, they cheat their brothers, their sisters. Cheating is at home. Marriage people, they cheat their spouses. Cheating has become part of the society. When you go to the market, you are cheated. The way you want to buy, say, salt or curry, the one selling it to you had filled the container to a certain percentage. It's cheating. When you want to buy cloth or something, they would cut a portion of it. Sometimes when you buy a piece of cloth and you measure, you realize they've even cut some uh, inches or meters away from it. It's all cheating. So cheating in smaller base everywhere you go has reflected in cheating in our examination and something drastically must be done. I want pastors, imams everywhere. We should all rise up and join this campaign against cheating in the nation. That's why corruption has been the order of the day. We started little drops of water will make a mighty ocean. So cheating from the home, cheating outside, cheating on your boyfriend, cheating on your girlfriend, cheating on your spouse, cheating everywhere, even in the church, everywhere we find ourselves, there is an element of cheating. And this will give maturity in future that people will drain the government coffers. And For Mrs. Jackson, those who cheat are mostly those who become corrupt in public office. Cheating in examination, then we are breeding a generation to be corrupt. Because when you cheat and you finish even university, wherever you are going to work, you will cheat. If you are an accountant, you will cheat. Any work you are called to do, you will cheat. If you are architect, you will cheat. If you are a doctor, you will cheat. Wherever you find yourself, you will realize that Teach, cheating is part of humanity and therefore when you cheat you are smarter than those who didn't cheat and you would want to do it the more to prove to people that you are clever. Look at the fraudulent way people are cheating others from the banks and mobile money. Look at the trend where this thing is rising, occultism is rising. The youth want to acquire riches in a short time. They want to get money without working. And cheating in schools, if we don't halt this activity, they will end up in cheating, draining government coffers in future. There is also a general view that teachers themselves who facilitate cheating are not stimulated solely by bribes. Their own performance evaluations tend to be based on their students' pass rate, giving them other reasons to cheat. And in some schools, I'm so sad, some schools would want to publish that. They had 100% BEC and 100% OAC, and therefore they will also move heaven and earth to ensure that the students cheat so that they can get that information to entice people to come into their school. But they are not the only ones. In a manner, some district officers, when they were assessing students' performance district-wise, no DCE or MCE would want to hear that. My district, they had zero performance in BEC. So I will also make the effort that my district I also get a good results. So all these have accounted to helping the children 
to cheat because some DCs would even go to the extent of manipulating, recruiting invigilators when it's time for BEC. As a country finds quick solution to fix the problem, how does it find lasting remedy to the heart of it? A report by Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin. It was all joy as the multimedia group joined the MTN Foundation to hand over a six-unit classroom block and teachers' bungalow to residents of Inshiai, so in the Ashanti Achim North district of the Ashanti region. The project executed at the cost of half a million Ghana cities followed a joint news agenda report highlighting the deplorable and life-threatening nature of classrooms at the school. Here's uh, Jim Agla of Multimedia Group Kumasi. From the entire management and staff of the Multimedia Group, we're here to say thank you to MTN Ghana for hearing our voice and heeding the cries of the students of this community by putting up this beautiful infrastructure. We need to know how this whole journey began. And so I'd like to share a brief history of why or how we got here today. In 2017, our own investigative journalist, Mr. Ohiming Temia, of the Multimedia Group, set out to investigate farmer and herdsmen clashes at Agogo in the Asante Akim North District. The project called Violent Shepherds was featured on our radio and television brands across the country. Violent Shepherds revealed how the headsmen, the Fulani headsmen, led the killing of 56 natives of Agogo and the destruction of several acres of farmlands between the years 2002 and 2010. Upon receiving government's attention, the headsmen were flushed out from this enclave. This has led to an increase in the export potential of local farmers who now have the capability and the opportunity to export their produce outside of the country. Violent shepherds told how junior high school students of Inshaisu who trek for about 36 kilometers, I don't believe this, 36 kilometers daily to nearby Ananikrum to school were sexually harassed and abused by the Fulani headsmen. Their plight was highlighted on Joy News' agenda program, which also focused on the dilapidated educational infrastructure in the community. And so to cut a long sh story short, MTN intervened and put up this beautiful infrastructure. So the board and directors of multimedia have sent me here to say thank you to MTN Ghana Foundation and to Nananum and to everybody who contributed to the success of this beautiful program. Ghana has become the latest recipient of the world's first ever global world's first ever global safety and hygiene stamp, which was recently launched by the World Travel. And all of that, we have details for you in business. <music> Hello everyone, it's now time for business. Now, Ghana has become the latest recipient of the world's first ever global safety and hygiene stamp, which was recently launched by the World Trade and Tourism Council. Now, the stamp created by the WTTC in May this year allows travelers to identify destinations and businesses around the world which have adopted the global standardized health and hygiene protocols. Chief Executive of the Ghana Tourism Authority, Akwesi Ajiman, says this development opens more strict measures for Ghana's tourism industry going forward. Now, the second lady, Samira Baumia, has lamented what she has observed to be the inability of many Ghanaian women to access loans for their businesses. Even though a 2019 IMF report indicates that women are less likely to default on loans, most of them have issues accessing credit for their businesses. 
She spoke at the launch of the Young Women Entrepreneurship Initiative put together by the Ministry of Business Development. The International Monetary Fund, the IMF, indicates that 37% of women in sub-Saharan Africa have bank accounts and access to formal financial institutions and saving mechanisms. These low rates persist despite the fact that women are less likely to default on loans than men. Mr. Minister, women pay their loans, so give them more. <laughs> The effect of this is the continuous low market share of women entrepreneurs. This ought to change, and I believe from today we will see that change. The narrative in this country would change, and it has to change. For entrepreneurship to thrive, there is a need to create an enabling environment which allows business to flourish. Ensuring that this becomes a reality is the collective responsibility of both governments and the private sector. An environment enabling of entrepreneurship is one which works together to eliminate barriers, one which reduces the level of bureaucracy faced by entrepreneurs, and an environment that makes financial resources and knowledge accessible. Resolving this accessibility problem is the goal of this project, which is the Young Women Entrepreneurship Initiative. We need to have an honest conversation on the question of equal business opportunities and compensation for labor for women. We know women are generally underpaid, and that has to change as well. Development Mohamed Awal has been outlining the contributions by government to women businesses. He says jobs have so far been created to support women in business. The last few years, more businesses in Ghana have been owned by women. And it's very encouraging because where women own businesses, the economy grows and jobs are created. However, unfortunately, majority of these businesses owned by women and necessary driven entrepreneurs. They only create the jobs for themselves and their immediate families. The intention for most of them is not aspirational. It is therefore important that there is policy to help transition our women from necessary driven entrepreneurs to opportunity driven entrepreneurs, where the women can expand their businesses and compete. That's why we are doing this program today with the support of Ex Excellences Foundation. Monday, two days ago, the President of the Republic, Nana Kufuado, commissions after Secretariat and hand over to the AU. The African Continent Prayer Project has 1.2 billion people with 3.3 trillion dollar annual revenues. Ghana should not be a spectator in after. Ghana should prepare its people and take advantage of the container free trade business that's going to reach in 3.3 billion. Now, charcoal imports on the rise, as consumers say, imports are far better off, especially when there is quality. We have more in the business news summary. Producer price inflation rate fell slightly in July to 9.3%, compared with a revised 9.5% recorded in June. The month-on-month -month change in producer price index in July 2020 was 1.7%. The Ghana Statistical Service explained that the marginal decrease in all industry inflation rates from 9.5% in June 2020 to 9.3% in July 2020 was as a result of the decline in inflation rate in the utility subsector. The low quality of some locally produced charcoal is full in the desire of some Ghanaians to use imported ones, which consumers note are processed, efficient, clean and do not produce ash or sparks. Prosper Ahmed Amakwando, inspector in charge of renewable energy at the Energy Commission, has said. And that's it by way of business tonight. Gary L. Smith is up next with sports. <laughs> Moving on, and just two hours ago, we got some great news involving the captain of the Black Stars, Andre Dede Ayu. Today, Swansea, his club, had their season awards to reward the best players, and Dede got four awards, making... Uh, let's go back and check the awards, yes. 
he got supporters player of the season, the players player of the season, which means uh, the players voted him as the best among them, the away player of the season, and the top goal scorer. Let's look at the statistics which made him the top goal scorer and gave him these awards. He scored 18 goals in 47 games and had seven assists as well as they came so close to making it to the Premier League. And so that's on our Instagram. Of course, it's Joy Sports GH. Please log on there to see all our great pictorial stories. Ghanaian featherweight, uh, featherweight boxer, that's Patrick Alote, has revealed that financial distress he went through uh, due to his six-month ban following a scuffle with a football fan in January this year. He says that has affected his training. He was on sports today this afternoon, and Susan Osu filed this report. Alote was banned for six months by the boxing governing body in the country. The period of his suspension elapsed on August 3, 2020. But Secretary General of the GBA, Patrick Johnson, told Joy Sports they had forgotten to officially lift the ban following a public appeal from the Walter Waite boxer. It escaped me in my mind. So it, it was the president who prompted me. But very soon, by end, the end of the week, hopefully, uh, uh, I will send him such a letter that the ban has been lifted on him so that quickly... He will start trading. The GBA officially communicated the end of Alotte's ban to him and his management earlier this week. He tells Joy Sports light training has begun. Uh, I have started preparation lightly, like you said, but not seriously because, you know, financial problem. The last time we spoke, uh, I think the manag manager did not um, <laughs> make things um, uh, open. But I think uh, I've started uh, depression uh, lightly so that any time that they, they, will, like, they will be ready to call me in the ring again, then I'm good to go. Because I, I don't need to stay, uh, stay at home always. Yeah, I don't want to get fat and I don't want to uh, put on uh, a lot of weight. So, for myself, the job is mine, and so um, I have started doing something small, small. Yeah, the management, I think for them, they are, what I can say is that they are helping my career to uh, reach uh, where I want it to be. So I have to um, um, help myself too. Patrick Alote was banned for physically assaulting a football fan earlier this year. If you ever needed proof that money can sometimes give you good health well there it is there i'm gary al smith and that's the sport remember tomorrow there's the europa league final and we have live commentary of that on joy fm more details in our subsequent bulletins thank you for your time Time now for the interactive segment and uh, the former president Mahama, who is also flag bearer of the NDC, threw a challenge to the president Ekofuado that they should have a debate over infrastructure records and actually settle that matter of who has done more. And we posted that comment. Uh, don't forget the NPP has responded that a debate between uh, the president and vice president Baumia is not on their book uh, at the moment. Let's check out what you've been saying on Facebook. A number of comments there, 155 comments, uh, 38 uh, shares, and 282 likes. Let's check out what you've been saying. Bastik Man Mark says, I wonder the way MPP people are bleeding with this call, at least your Ekofuado will say, fellow Ghanaians, how GM will give this ancestor though Competi tough competition leading to his death. Okay, Techi Elvis Lawson says, we don't need words as a debate pre presents. A debate presents. In our respective constituencies, we, the voters, will compare records to vote. I hope your circle interchange in Accra would make me vote for you at my constituency in Doma, where my brothers are enjoying free SHS. And a lot more of your comments there. Uh, Thomas Owus... Nelson Afari says, joke of the year. Are you sure you won't check him out? Thomas also says, point of correction. We don't have two presidents, man. Qualify a status why you are former president.
president. And Roski says, yes, Mr. Competence, we only got to know how competent you are after trying the short man. Maxwell Amansunu says, my brother, please do away from politics. You know yourself, please. And those are some comments on Facebook. There are more comments there. You can log on to the uh, Joy News Facebook platform and read more comments. And that'll be it for the bulletin also tonight. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Many thanks for watching. PM Express Business Edition is up next. Enjoy the rest of our programs.